For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into this world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body as thou prepared me. This is a transition that I need to draw our attention to. Are you there with me? Now, the transition that I'm trying to draw your attention to is the key to understanding New Testament priesthood. And this transition has to do with migrating from sacrifice to a living sacrifice. That's what that scripture is. How many of you still remember that in the Old Testament, um, you bring a goat, and the goat is what is sacrificed? So, and the implication of that sacrifice applies to you, even though you were not the one that physically suffered the depravity that the goat was subjected to. But the spiritual effect of the sacrifice of the goat applies to you. Now, what Jesus did when he came to become the ultimate sacrifice was that it was no longer goats that were sacrificed. It became an experience that a man will experience. Do you understand that? Or oh, you didn't get that? So, we move, there is a slight movement there, from sacrifice to living sacrifice. Now, our New Testament priesthood is founded, as you will see in a moment, is founded and predicated upon the efforts that Jesus has already made. And you need to understand it very well so that when we begin to apply it, as we apply it in the natural, it might look, it, it might not look powerful. But the consequence it has in the spirit is the reason why we operate that way. Is that, is that clear? Remember that all forms of priesthood in the New Testament is predicated on what Jesus did. Because without the sacrifice of Jesus, we will not even have any priesthood at all. I'm going to show you the infrastructure that was in the temple. When you move from the outer court into the holy place, the first furniture you will see is what is called the brazen altar. All forms of priesthood in that corridor is based on that brazen altar. Those of you that are students of the Bible, that have labored in the Bible for a while, you understand the meaning of brazen, bronze. Bronze means judgment. And judgment was what was revealed to Adam in the garden when God told him that in the day that you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. That's the, posi the position of God's um, justice system. So the judgment that was already hanging over man on the account of that rebellion existed before man committed the infringement. Is that not how law is? You are not, you are not following me. That's how law is. I don't know, um, maybe Barista Kasa will help us. If somebody steals a goat and is confirmed that the person has stolen a goat, what is the likely penalty that is going to receive? Please arm him with the microphone, please. What is the likely penalty that the person... Please, when you are coming for, for Bible study, come armed because you can be confronted with the microphone. <laughs> What's the likely penalty that the person is to face if it is confirmed that the person stole a goat? The law that is already there will be applied against the person to the effect that he should either be in prison for a term of years okay. or a it's equivalent of a fine. Okay, if someone breaks into um, a residence yeah. and in, the, in his efforts, somebody dies, what's the position of the law about uh, that situation? Okay, that's a capital offense. It's a capital offense. Yes, so straight away, he will, uh, the, the law will require him to also be imprisoned for a term of years. For a term of years, yes. you see. So what I'm trying to say is that the, the position of the law is already established about these crimes. It is not when you commit the crime that the law will be formulated, formulated to accommodate it. The law already has penalties. That, okay, that's what I just wanted that you confirm. Thank you. Now, so what we are seeing here, what we are seeing here is that God told Adam that if he eats of that fruit, that the judgment about that level of departure is already captured in the justice system of heaven. So when Jesus came, the major assignment of Jesus was to undo, was to create an escape route for humankind because humankind is already on the bad side of the law. 
And in order for Jesus to make a way for humankind, uh, judgment had to, he had to receive that judgment. He had to submit to that judgment. So the ultimate purpose of Jesus in his ministry was to offer himself in order to satisfy the claims of divine justice. But the principle of substitution so that you and me can have a way to experience life. So Jesus took our place in judgment so that we can take his place in life. That's the story of the gospel. Now, so all of our priesthood is based on the foundation of what Jesus did. So the, what Jesus did is what is referred to or what is seen as the brazen altar in the holy place. Are you clear? Are you there? So the sacrifice of Jesus is the biggest altar that you can ever find. And our priesthood is based on interacting with that is sacrifice and applying it in various fashions, in various forms. Because in Jesus, sacrifice passes to become a living sacrifice. Sacrifices previously were external things that were given. But this priesthood that Jesus came to manifest, which is the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, it is human beings that become the sacrifice. You get that? Oh, you didn't get it? Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, sacrifices, offerings, thou wouldest not. It means that the sacrifices that were offered in the Old Testament did not really have the ability to undo the things for which they were offered. So when Jesus came, he said, sacrifices, burnt offerings, that you would not, but a body you have prepared for me. The reason why you have given me a body is so that I can become the ultimate sacrifice. Can you see that the sacrifice now has moved from animals and it has moved to a man? You get that? A body. That was the reason why Jesus was assigned a body so that he can pay the ultimate price, the ultimate type of sacrifice that will be pleasing in the sight of God that will satisfy the claims of divine justice. Go on. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Go on. Then said I, lo, I am come in the, in, in the volume of the book, as it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Yeah? Above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not neither has pleasure therein which are offered by the law it means the law did not satisfy god it only appeased god for a time and that is why it was repeated because it was just a means of appeasement it was not a means of satisfaction so the claims of divine justice were not satisfied under the law if you come and bring a bull and sacrifice it might cover your offense for a time but uh, that the implication of that sacrifice and the vocabulary of the blood that is shed will begin to wane in the realm of the spirit until it fully evaporates after a time so you will need to redo that sacrifice again so that you can experience and enjoy the same level of immunity are you there all right, so the reason why the sacrifices had to be cyclical and continuous is because they did not have the ability to satisfy God. Now, this is January, so most of you bought Christmas goat, bought Christmas ram. Please, what is the average cost of Christmas goat? Pastor Chooks, I know you, a goat laid down his life so that you could celebrate. What, what, what was the cost of that goat? Oh, you're not the one that is in that department. Exactly. Okay, Pastor Chooks is on the high side. So he, he has people that take care of such issues. I'm talking about someone that can give us the current market price for good right now. Huh? You know, I've not been to the market for a long time. For a very long time. Okay, somebody's coming up here. I'm hearing 45,000. What? <laughs> 60,000, depending on the size of the stomach. 
Now, now, okay. Let me ask you a question. If every time you lie, you will need to bring a goat to consider 2023, how many goats would you have been required to make available? So if you study the book of Galatians, you will find a terminology called the curse of the law. Have you, have you seen that? The curse of the law. You know what the curse of the law is? The requirement for sacrifices, for offenses. Even if you are a, be a billionaire and you are offering one goat of 60,000 naira per, per lie, and maybe the one for fornication might, might be ram. The, one, the other day, we were sending somebody with bride price to go and pay for a lady in, in Botswana. It was seven cows. Oh. Oh. Seven cows. What's the, what's, how much does a cow cost? Uh. <laughs> we went to price. We went to, I, I didn't know that it's only in Nigeria that they price around bride price. Oh. If you try to apply somewhere else, it's, it's an insult. So when they say seven, they mean seven. So, are you there? So it means according to Botswana culture, the cost of a man is seven cows. So if the person commits murder and somebody dies, the number of cows you need to bring to atone for that error might be seven cows. How much does one cow go for? You already seen that all of us will be in debt. None of us will be rich enough to, to cover the level of atonement that is needed in order for us to walk free of the wrath of God. None of us. So that is what we call the cost of the law. The cost of paying for your infringements against God. <laughs> you and me don't have enough resources to pay for it. Exactly. Alright, so Jesus is bringing a new kind of priesthood. And the new kind of priesthood that is bringing on the scene is what we call the priesthood of the living sacrifice. <laughs> this priesthood is going to affect you and me. This new type of priesthood. Are you there? Okay, so. Then said he, Lo, I am come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. It's, it's because of the inadequacies of the sacrifices of the Old Testament that God had to send his son and he gave his son a body so that he can offer himself as a sacrifice that he will, he can accept. Do you still remember the parable of savory meat that I love? That savory meat is Jesus Christ because the sacrifices under the Old Testament did not have enough stature to satisfy God. Are you, are you there? Now, so I want to draw your attention to some matters. Before we leave Hebrews chapter 10, I will still want us to read Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 before we migrate. Are you still with me? Now, the reason why I'm going this way and showing you the broad concept of priesthood that is practiced in the Levitical order is so that when we zero down and begin to establish how to raise a personal altar. Are you with me? You would have understood the concept of priesthood and it will be easy for you to apply. It will be easy for you to practice it personally. And from an experiential perspective, I will be able to suggest to you the kind of implication that you are going to derive by practicing priesthood in the art of establishing a personal altar. So when we finish talking about a personal altar, then we move to a community or a family altar. Then we move to a national altar. It sustains the same principles, but its application in each case, might be just a little different. And uh, when it goes beyond a personal altar, there, is, there are other terminologies we are going to include in describing it, like quorum. quorum. Uh, why is it that on the day of Pentecost, there had to be 120? In which other place do you find 120 people that are... Is there any other parallel that carries 120 in the Bible? Oh, for you, it's no. <laughs> you see, God is a God of patterns. He's a God of science. There's a pattern to the things he does. He doesn't do things one-off because he's prophetic. What he does in the Old Testament is pointing to something he will do in the New Testament. And so there are certain patterns that will be littered around what he does in the Old Testament so that when he begins to do it in the New, you can now say, oh, this is that. This is 
that there are parallels in the Bible that will give you insight into what God is fulfilling. Are you there? Okay. So, verse number one, it says, For the law, having a shadow of things to come, the first thing about the law is that it is prophetic. Second thing you need to know is that it is not the very image of the things. And the sacrifices that were offered therein could not make such that came unto it perfect. Now, the reason why I came back here is to show you just the number one point that I raised. It is a shadow of good things. Not just shadow of things to come, but shadow of good things to come. So we are going to look at the Old Testament context and I'm not so concerned about that. We will see what it points to and we are going to take our education from the things that all the shadow of um, offerings, all the shadow of sacrifices point to so that we can understand our position and the implication of those sacrifices within the context of the new covenant. Because that is, that is such that is applicable to you and to me. Are you there? You know we spoke about sacrifices yesterday and I told you that a sacrifice is something that can be offered to a spirit being that a spirit being will be satisfied about. So if, if at this point I decide to ask you a question, what do you think that if you offer God, God will be satisfied about? Do you have an answer to that question? You know the answer to the question? Moses knew those things. Moses knew the things that God will accept. He knew the things that God will be satisfied about. And if we want to study priesthood, there's no way we can escape studying the life and the ministry of Moses. Do you still remember um, the Passover? The Passover in Egypt? Still remember it? Still remember what was about to happen? It was the angel of death that was about to visit Egypt. It was already concluded. God had given the decree and the angel of death was mobilized. And then Moses now, because he has a relationship with God, went to consult God and God gave him a word of wisdom. The word of wisdom that God gave Moses could not stop the decree that had gone forth about the angel of death visiting Egypt. But the word of wisdom that God gave to Moses was able to confuse the angel. He said, take the blood of a ram, put it on your doorpost, put it on the lintel of your house. And the children of Israel did it. When the angel of death came to Israel, he said, and somebody help me kill the firstborn here. So he passed over. So when you hear Passover, don't think that they were preferred just because they were Israelites. They were preferred. They were, the angel that was sent to carry out their assignment was confused because Moses operated a wisdom that came from a superior realm. So in the eyes of that angel, the sons of Goshen, the firstborn of Goshen were already sacrificed. That's why he passed over to finish the assignment. He said, somebody help me oh. The person has helped me to do this assignment. You see, that's where priesthood comes in. Oh my, you are not here. You are not here. You, you heard what uh, Sister Queen, where's Queen? Do you know people have been asking me questions? That, okay, if, if some, a wizard can raise the dead, hey, then what are we doing? I said, calm down. So, so I went on research. When you were sleeping, <laughs> when you were sleeping yesterday, I was researching. Now, do you realize, so Queen will need to come and confirm this. The only people that your grandfather could raise from the dead were people that witchcraft killed. There is a difference between witchcraft death and normal death. Normal death comes by a decree from God, from the sovereign. Witchcraft death is like, like an arm robber praying on something that is not his own. It's not in the archives, it's not in the records that this person should depart at this time. They use witchcraft to edge the person out. It was not as if an arm robber came to break his skull. It was witchcraft they used to edge him out. And when they edge people out like that, they are, they are prison houses that they can be kept for a time. Their spirit, I mean. It is from those prison houses that the man had wisdom in the priesthood of darkness as to how to set that captive free so it was not actual resurrection. It's just restoration of what was stolen. 
Because people called me and said, hey, so wizards can... I said, calm down, calm down, it's okay. But do you see, do you see how much control that wizard had because of the knowledge of priesthood? Do you realize that you cannot be effective in priesthood if you are ignorant? It doesn't work with priesthood. Spiritual knowledge is the currency with which we do priesthood. Are you still with me? Oh, you are not following me. First Samuel chapter 7, let me clear your doubt. First Samuel chapter 7 from verse 3 to 10. First Samuel 7 from verse 3 to verse number 10. You don't know how powerful you can become when, if you understand what I want to teach, you know why I'm teaching this with passion, so that the counseling can reduce. The hi, Jesus. I finish teaching, then you see people outside. Ah, that is. Some will say, we came from, you know what? It's the knowledge of priesthood that is lacking. That's why the people of God look helpless because they lack spiritual knowledge. There is no way we can master this thing without looking at the ministry of Moses. Exactly. Now, see what Samuel did. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your heart, and put away the strange gods and asteroids from among you, and prepare your heart unto the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Balim and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. Verse 5, And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mishpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together in Mishpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord. That is like a libation. And fasted on that day and said, We have sinned against the Lord and Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mishpah. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together in Mishpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said unto Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord God for us, that he will save us out of the hands of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb. Where did he get that knowledge? Hmm. You know what? You might lack soldiers in your army. You might lack, you might lack economists in your cabinet. Are you there? You don't lack a priest that knows the way of priesthood. These guys were, 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 in, were in national repentance. And the Philistines felt they were vulnerable because they were by the altar of prayer. They said, let's kill them before they recover. <laughs> when the wind of what they had in mind got to Samuel, he took the, the, the child, the child of a lamb. <laughs> Jesus Christ. How did he know that that was what was required? And offered it for a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel, but the Lord turned that from heaven. That means that offering moved the hand of God. <laughs> we, we are going to study the Bible. You see, hey, there were battles in Scripture that they were not fought with sword and shield. Are you there? Those days when we were in the office, I don't know what was wrong with our office. If you get a promotion and the next person doesn't get a promotion, in fact, when they promote you, keep quiet. Just pretend as if. <laughs> let, no, <laughs> let nobody know because it is, it's a serious problem. And people are attacking people, not just with words, so spiritually. You will see somebody after work on Friday, before Monday he has died. And somebody would think that it is his certificate from Benin State University that he made first class that will qualify him to work in such a place. Your certificate can give you access to the place, but to survive the place, you will need something else. 
So what I'm saying is that uh, Moses helped us with all the details of how to appease God. I need to give us an overview of the book of Leviticus. I think I've done that before. Just to aid understanding. All right? Yes, it is good for us to go into scriptures, single scriptures, and plot the mind of God out by bringing scriptures together. That's good. But once and again, we need to look at the general overview so that you can understand the concept of what God is actually doing within the pages of the Bible. Now, the idea of the book of Leviticus was that God is a holy God and man is a sinful man. What, how can a holy God deal with sinful man? His nature of holiness will make him judge sinful man, so there is no possibility of sinful man, sinful man doing business with the holy God. Hence, the need for priesthood. Moses was able to gain insight into all the kinds of sacrifices that are needed to appease God so that humankind can have dealings with a holy God. 